Well, you can grab a seat this morning. We're so thankful you're here. If I haven't had the opportunity to meet you, my name is Todd, and me and our family get the opportunity to serve as the lead pastors here, so we're glad you're here this morning. And uh, man, I don't wanna waste any time. Uh, I've actually asked my wife to come and speak to us today. She is one of our associate pastors here, and she works in the area of spiritual development, so she handles a lot of our small groups and a lot of our freedom groups and those type things. And uh, man, when we laid this series out several weeks ago, uh, I knew that she would be able to communicate some things and maybe in a way uh, that I, I couldn't. I'll be back next week to kind of wrap up this series. But would you put your hands together and welcome Avery Forrest to the stage? <laughs> Love you, babe. Love you too. Awesome. I am so excited to be uh, sharing with you guys today in this series. How many of y'all have been loving this series so far? Like, it's crazy that it's, this is only week three because I feel like this series has been so good. I feel like we've been weeks into it now, but I am so, so excited to share uh, today. But before we get started, um, we've just been kind of starting off this series each week, kind of welcoming those who are new to the church and, and haven't been with us for a really long time. We, we do take certain seats where we focus on certain things. So uh, in a few weeks, we're gonna be focusing all on Jesus. But for this month of February, we are focusing on relationships and not just marriage relationships because we believe that the most important relationship besides Jesus uh, that you that you uh, yoke your life with are the people that you do life with. So that is marriage, one, but also friendships, those sort of things. So making sure that we have good, strong, biblical, interpersonal relationships is a big deal. And so that's why the Bible is not a relationship book, but it has plenty of information in it that lets us know how to conduct our relationships. Now, before we really get started, though, I don't know if there's been a few of you guys in the room for the past couple weeks that has been confused like I have been and has been a little bit distracted by this little word right up here. Anybody? Anybody else? But, okay, a couple of you. Okay, the first week, I was like, what is illysome? Man, our team misspelled something. So I look at my 13-year-old and I was like, what do you think Illysum means? <laughs> you guys, it means I love you so much, okay? <laughs> my 13-year-old looked at me and he was like, mom, are you <laughs> kidding me right now? So those of you that have been distracted, you can be, you can be done being distracted now. I have, solved, <laughs> I have solved the problem for you. I am the worst when it comes to acronyms and like kid slang and all that sort of stuff. But each week, we have been filling in the blank on love. First comes love, then comes blank. And so we're going to get dive right in today because, as you see, we've got some baggage with us still here today that we want to deal with. And so we want to jump right into um, applying the fact that um, first comes love, then comes what? What do you guys think? First comes love. Our blank today is conflict. Everybody say, uh-oh. <laughs> First comes love, then comes conflict. Um, last week, Pastor Todd mentioned uh, that in, in the baggage sermon that some of us had certain family baggage that like went with us everywhere, right? And one of the pieces of family baggage that typically will go with us is how we deal with conflict, okay? We learn to deal with conflict in our families, but here's what I know. Even if we learned that way, we do not have to carry a bag full of unhealthy ways to resolve conflict for the rest of our lives. We can learn how to do conflict in a healthy way if we want to. Everybody say amen. amen. All right, so here's the thing about conflict. If you are breathing, you will have conflict in your life, all right? If you have a pulse, there will be conflict in your life at some point in time. If you are older than five years old, you have a method of how you deal with conflict in your life, all right? And you learned it somewhere, and you either learned it in your family or you have grown and learned how to deal with it in the right way. And so today, I do feel like there's about three categories of the way that people deal with conflict. And you do not have to be a pastor to know that most people have not learned how to healthily deal with conflict, all right? How many in the room feel like you're very confident that you deal with conflict in a very healthy way? A few of you. Okay, good. That's good. Um, so the first uh, way that a lot of people learn to deal with conflict, though, is through combat, all right, so we're gonna unpack our combat 
bag right here, all right? Anybody want to unpack this with me? See how some of those combat? Now, if you know somebody who deals with conflict this way, if you are sitting next to somebody who deals with conflict this way, don't nudge them, don't elbow them, just pray for them. Just let the Holy Spirit <laughs> deal with that person, all right? So combat people are typically people who use like anger, frustration, maybe even explosive tactics. But there's like my favorite people that deal with combative conflict are actually the ones that we call the passive aggressive people. All right, so the passive aggressive people, they look innocent enough, right? Like a Nerf gun, Nerf bullets won't hurt anybody, right? <laughs> They won't hurt anybody. They're just, they're just, you know, I was just kidding when I said that. <laughs> I wish you were that way. I was just kidding about that. Oh, that was close. That was bad. <laughs> Nerf guns won't hit anybody or hurt anybody until you hit them in the exact right place and we're in the emergency room getting fitted for a glass eye, right? Like... <laughs> These things can be really dangerous. So passive aggressive people can hurt you in the exact right way. They know what they're doing, right? All right. The next people in the room that are combatters are yellers. Got any yellers in the room? Okay, this was hard for me because I'm not a yeller. <laughs> you stupid idiot. Anybody ever heard that in their house? No, never. <laughs> You're such a fool. Why would you ever do something like that? Yeah? Anybody? Anybody? You got some yellers in your home? Okay, cool. And then the last in the combative zone are the ones I call the exploders. Now, the exploders, the, the thing that's crazy about them is you just don't ever know when it's going to happen right? Like they are, they're crafty and they're, and they're really, they're really cunning. And then you just don't know. You never know when an exploder is going to explode. You never know. You never know. Security team, calm down. All right. Those are the combaters. The next group of people we have are the controllers. Anybody know a controller? Don't point. Don't point. All right. Don't nudge. Don't nudge. We got controlling people. Now, the controlling people, they're really, really crafty when it comes to, um, to conflict because these are where we get the manipulators. They use fear. They use accusation, right? It's going down. That is a controller's like element, right? And they are going to accuse the mess out of you because if they can accuse you, if they can poke you, if they can, if they can instigate you, then it's your fault, not, oh, so good. it's your fault, right? So they're the accusers, they're pointers. They, that is what they're constantly doing and it's going down with a controller, all right? They're also, they're also threateners, now, the reason I brought a little lighter here is because a threatener, they, they like to play with something that's little, but they know it could cause a lot of damage if they actually lit something on fire, right? So the threateners are, you know, I'll leave, I'll leave, because if they actually left, it would cause a lot of damage, right? I'll pack the kids up. I wouldn't be a friend like that. You know, I mean, this is the way a threatener is. They, they threaten with just enough little, little bit of a fear, right? And then a controller is also usually a scorekeeper, all right? And their score is always going to be zero because, again, they've got to control the situation. So it always has to be your fault. So they're always keeping score, right? And, and you're usually always losing when you're dealing with a controller in conflict, all right, now, I got this little case right here, and I will just say this. Don't let the size of the case fool you, because these are the compressors, all right? <laughs> this is the last group of people here, and, and they're, they're silent but deadly, all right? <laughs> the, the small case should not fool you when it comes to dealing with a compressor, and let's talk about who the compressors are. The compressors are those people who keep a logbook of every little thing, every little moment, every little concern, 
We were driving down Highway 59 at 9.55 a.m., 50.2.5 miles an hour, and you said this. <laughs> and they file it away. And they all, whoop, lost my pen. And they're always, they're always filing. I mean, they got a whole book on you, okay? And they will pull it out at the exact right time. Other people that are compressors are the people who are the, it's fine. Everything is fine at all cost. At all cost, it's fine. No, 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 we're good. Sunshine and fairy farts. <laughs> Everything's good. Everything's good. And then the compressors are also the people who I call thought bubblers. Got some in my hair? Okay. They're the thought bubblers. These are the people, so when they're, when they're taking a log, when they're saying everything is fine, they are also having imaginary conflict with you in their mind, okay? They are go ahead and having, they're confronting you, but they'll never confront you. They'll just fill in the blanks. They'll fill in the thought bubble. They will, they will know already how the conversation is going to go, and then they're actually going to end up at matter at you at the end of the fake conversation than they ever will if they would truly just confront the situation in their lives. So here's the deal. If you're married, if you're looking to be married, if you're a friend, if you're a parent, if you're a teacher, if you're a boss, if you're, you will have conflict in your life, okay? And you have to decide that these ways are unhealthy, that these ways are unwise, that the way that we learned it isn't right and it isn't working. And so we have to make sure that we do it God's way. But just because we were raised that way or we learned that way doesn't mean that we have to continue that way, all right? If you are breathing, you're going to have to deal with conflict. But God gives us instruction. He gives us his word. He tells us how we can deal with conflict. And this is why. God tells us that we should deal in a certain way with one another because every another is a person that Jesus died for. Every another is a person that Jesus died for and they're important. And so what we have to know is that from this day forward, it doesn't matter what came in my bag or what I packed in my bag. From this day forward, I can decide what to pack in my bag and what to take with me and how I can deal with conflict. And that is what we have to decide to do. So we are gonna very quickly, because if you saw on your notes, there are three points with three subpoints. all right? <laughs> I just trumped Todd's five points from last week, uh, <laughs> if you can do the math. Um, but what we were gonna do last week, Todd talked a little bit about a roadmap, so I liked that idea since we're packing a bag. I figured we'd go on a little road trip together again today, and I want you to think of these as important stops, because they all build on each other, on how we should deal with conflict in our lives. And these are important stops on the journey. So again, the Bible is not a relationship, book, but it gives us plenty of ways to deal with one another. And conflict is inevitable, but how I respond is up to me. All right? So the first stop is we have to confront with love. We have to confront with love. Now, again, if you illy sum someone, remember what that means? Okay. <laughs> If you, if you love someone, if, they, if you're married to them, if they're a friend, neighbor, coworker, child, the first and foremost, as believers, we should deal with them in love for the glory of God, all right? But this is the problem. So often, we are the most unloving to those that we say we love the most. So often, we are the most unloving to those we say we love the most. And I'm gonna be super basic on this passage of scripture here real quick, and if you grew up in church, I want you to get like this cliche scripture out of your mind, and I actually want you to maybe whisper a prayer to the Holy Spirit real fast and say, Holy Spirit, challenge me, check me. If I'm not treating people this way, then, then, then convict me on it. And so we're gonna read this passage of scripture together. Uh, it's 1 Corinthians 13, four through seven. If you're new with us, um, when it comes on the screen, we read the underlined words together. Um, we got it? Okay. Love is, love is, it does not, it does not, it is not proud. It is not easily angered. It is not self-seeking. It keeps no record of wrongs. Uh, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Conflict will not ruin your relationships. Conflict will not ruin your relationships, but not knowing how to work through them will. Conflict it will arise. And if we do not work through them in love, it will ruin our relationships. 
So I'm gonna hit these three sub points really, really fast. And there is no marriage or uh, friendship or relationship conversations for you to have this week because I put the passages of scripture on there for you and the Holy Spirit to go have some conversations this week. You and the Holy Spirit are gonna sit this week on these three sub points and you're gonna ask yourself with the Holy Spirit, do I deal with people in the right way through conflict, all right? And so the first one is we have to confront with clear vision. If we're gonna confront somebody in love, we have to confront with clear vision. Pastor Todd preached a sermon a while back called Plank Eye. I very highly recommend you going to listen to that uh, message. It's on Matthew 7, verse 5. And what this means when we confront with love is we evaluate our part first, all right? We have to get the plank out of our own eye first before we go to confront someone. And it's not so that they can just keep living the way they want. It's so that we can help them get the little speck out of their eye so we can still, in love, correct them. The other thing is, is you have to, uh, when we're confronting with clear vision, we have to make sure we have a lens of love on, all right? If you have foggy glasses, you're not seeing right, all right? So if your goal is winning or fighting to prove your point, then you are not confronting in love. And so when we have the wrong lens on, the lens lens of frustration or anger or bitterness, it is going to skew our view, and so your, your uh, goal with confronting with love has to be, I love this person and this person loves me. And we have to remember that. We do this with our son Carter all the time when we have, hey bud, how, mom and dad love you. So when we're bringing something to you, it's because we love you. Uh, the next uh, sub point there is confront with clear communication. You can go look up Ephesians 14 through 16 that talks about having truth and love. But clear communication is paramount in conflict. And it also will help prevent conflict. Todd and I, our first fight ever was because of unclear communication. We were married about a year. And uh, in that first year of marriage, I was really uh, wanting to be like the cool wife, all right? I didn't wanna be the ball and chain or the bag and hag. Like I wanted to be (laughs) the cool wife, all right? And we were at my sister's engagement party and Todd was with a group of guys and he's hanging out and they're probably talking guy stuff. Must have been talking about guns because he yells over, hey babe, will you give me permission to buy an AR-15? Y'all, I didn't even know what an AR-15 was, but I wanted to be the cool wife. So it's like, sure, babe, whatever you want to buy, go buy it. I was the cool wife, right? A week and a half later, that man right there walks into our house with an AR-15. I knew it couldn't have been a cheap gun, but what, what really blew me away was he actually thought we had a conversation. <laughs> and so I sat there a year into our marriage thinking, this is not good if he thought that that was clearly communicating. So we had, <laughs> we had to have some conflict right there and we had to learn how to clearly communicate. <laughs> it will resolve a lot of conflicts that never will start if you learn how to clearly communicate. And the third is confront with calm speech. Proverbs 15, uh, one says, slow to anger, quick to listen and slow to speak. I will say this, you should not be yelling at each other. If you are yelling, you're not in control. If you begin to yell, y'all need to agree, to take a little breather. This is friends, this is parents, this is, this is all areas. If you are yelling, you're not in control. And you cannot just say, well, this is just the way we are. This is just the way I learned. This is how it will always be. No, 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 no. Slow to anger, quick to listen, slow to speak. That's what scripture says. So even if that's the way you learned, you can unlearn it through the power and the help of the Holy Spirit. All right, so the other thing is you can't bring up what's already been repented of. Love doesn't count, all right? Um, The next stop on our roadmap is that you have to resolve with intention, all right? So we're gonna confront with love and then we're gonna resolve with intention. Now these, again, these are stops. You can't just have one without the other, all right? We gotta verify that we're loving each other. Then we gotta resolve with intention. And just like fixing our lens of love, our goal in conflict has to be to resolve the conflict. All right, that has to be a goal. And resolution always takes intention. Um, In Ephesians 4, 31, we're gonna look at the scripture together. It says this, everybody say it with me. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. All right, resolve has to be the end goal, but we also have to resolve with a kingdom mindset. 
Living in perpetual conflict will make anyone want to run, all right? <laughs> or if you want to stay in it, then there's something unhealthy that you need some counseling with too. But, but living in perpetual conflict, constantly battling will make anyone want to run. But we also have to resolve, resolve to have a kingdom mindset towards each other, compassionate, forgiving, just as in Christ God forgave you. All right, the next one, resolve, or the three stops on this are to resolve conflict with the end in mind, all right? And what I mean by this is uh, how it says in Proverbs 12, 18, and I'm gonna read this to you. You'll have to go look it up this week and let the word of God convict you, but it says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. If forever and covenant are the outcome if, if you wanna have a forever relationship with your kids, if you wanna have a covenant relationship with your spouse, if you wanna have covenant friendships in your life, you have to be careful with your words. You have to use healing words, all right? Because reckless words pierce like a sword. And I promise you, words can wound deeper than you ever imagined. We hear it all the time. In freedom, some of the most damaging wounds are from words, not even from physical abuse, all right? Todd says all the time that our goal is to sit on the front porch when we're 90 years old in moo-moos, I don't even know what that is, drinking coffee. But if that is the goal, then healing speech, resolving conflict with end in mind has to be our goal. So what is your end goal? In parenting and friendship and marriage and your relationships, what's your end goal? Uh, the next one is to resolve conflict in a responsible way. I want to say this, yelling, exploding, pointing, those are not responsible ways. Stuffing, taking score, those are not responsible ways. And let me tell you this, parents, the way you resolve conflict is the bag your children are packing. The way you resolve conflict with friends, with anybody in your life is the bag your, ch your children are packing and taking with them into their future relationships, all right? All right, so you're gonna have to look at James 1, 19 through 20 this week, but what it says at the end of it, it talks about how God has a way that he wants us to deal with conflict and it's to produce righteousness. That's what he desires at the end, all right? So we have to remember that every another is a person that Jesus died for. So we have to resolve conflict in a responsible way. And then the last one um, on this road stop is resolve conflict open to change. Resolve conflict open to change. In conflict, be able to be open to where you need to change in your life, okay? Sometimes this can be before the conflict, this can be in the middle of the conflict, or this could be at the end of the conflict. But be open to where you might need to change, all right? And here's how I like to say it. Let the Holy Spirit correct you before your spouse corrects you. Let the Holy Spirit correct you before a friend corrects you. Let the Holy Spirit correct you before anyone else has to come to you and correct you. I promise you the Holy Spirit is more loving with it than anyone else. But the reason I put Psalm 51 on there, and again, I encourage you to read that entire Psalm this week, not just 51 verse 10, but that is where David is confront, confronted by the uh, prophet Nathan after he um, committed sin and adultery with Bathsheba. And Nathan had to come and he had to point it out in David's life. And David went to the Lord and he said, create in me a pure heart, O God. But the entire Psalm is this beautiful prayer that I encourage you to pray this week. And instead of inviting your spouse maybe to correct you or a friend to correct you, go ahead and invite the Holy Spirit's correction into your life because of any conflict that you have to deal with in your life, if you let the Holy Spirit uh, deal with you differently, uh, you will be able to handle it correctly. Most conflict, though, arises because of the wounds that we still have that are wide open or are bandaged up the best that we, can, we could do. Most wounds that we cause to other people are because of the armor that we wear and put on that's actually a wall of protection for ourselves that literally is slicing and, and, and wounding the, the wounds of the others. So most of the time, you need to let the Holy Spirit heal you in places so that you can learn how to live peaceably with those in your life, so that you can learn to live without these big bags following you everywhere. When I let the Holy Spirit be the one to bring conflict to me in every area of my life that isn't pleasing to him, and I allow him to change me, I am able to live at peace with more people in my life, especially those I love. 
especially those I love. All right, and our third stop on this road trip is to combat with togetherness. Combat with togetherness. Rarely is conflict one-sided. Rarely. You are not in conflict alone. Even if it's the Holy Spirit that you are asking to bring conflict into your life against the things that, that go against his ways, the Holy Spirit's involved, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13, we're gonna look at this passage together. I want you guys to read the underlined words with me. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so is with Christ. For we were all baptized by so as to form whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the spirit, the one spirit to drink. You guys, we are a body. We are together whether we like it or not. If you're married, you're together whether you like it or not. You're one if you're married, all right? Uh, if you are a parent, you are together whether you like it or not. Kids, those are your parents, all right? <laughs> like, whether you like it or not, you've got to figure out how to live in community and togetherness. Um, if we, as the body of Christ, together in friendship, we are one body. So we must combat with togetherness. And here's how we do it. The three stops on this are we fight the fight, not each other. Good. Ephesians six twelve talks about the fact that we do not fight a battle of flesh and blood. I promise you, your spouse is not your enemy, okay? Your kid is not your enemy. Kid, your parent is not your enemy. Hopefully that friend is not your enemy. If not, get better friends, right? Like, but togetherness is how we fight and we fight the fight, not each other. So we've got to be able to call a spade a spade. We got to be able to call out what the enemy is actually doing. And here's what I would say. If you have wounds or if you have a wall of armor on, you're gonna have to let the Holy Spirit heal those. And you have to take the armor off because the only armor you should be wearing is the armor of God. And that armor helps you decipher every scheme of the enemy. All right, and so we, when you have the armor of God on, you will fight the fight, not each other. Uh, we fight for common ground. Psalms 133 says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's a very short Psalm, you can read the whole one this week, but there's a few more verses in there, but unity is a big deal to God. Unity is a big deal to God. So in marriage, we're one. When we fight the real enemy, we'll stop fighting each other and we'll contend for oneness. In friendships, in friendships, fight the real fight. And in faith community, unity is a big deal God. Let me ask you this. In conflict, and other conflict in your life, whether it's marriage, friendship, or whatever, have you talked to them or just about them? If you are constantly talking about your spouse to your coworkers and never actually talking to your spouse about the situation, it's gonna be so damaging. In community, if you're constantly talking about the other person instead of going to the person, you're gonna, you're gonna create a, 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 a log against them that's gonna get so big, you're never actually gonna be able to deal with any of it. And I'm sorry, but wise counsel is actually not what Matthew 18 says is the first step. The first step is actually to go to your brother or sister. And wise counsel isn't everybody on your friend list or everybody in your friend group asking them for their opinion. Oftentimes, we want to talk to everyone else for advice, but rarely actually go to the person and, and resolve with intention and love. And what that does is it disunifies, it breeds contention, it's gossip, it's slander, it brings church hurt, and it's, and it's hurtful, and it really does. Like, it has to stop because we have to combat with togetherness. And the third stop on this is that we fight to honor each other and our relationship. Philippians 2, three through five, it says this, do, and I, I wanna read this one, you're gonna have to read it this week with the Holy Spirit. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. I'm telling you guys, as I was preparing for this message for over a month now, Todd has to do it every week. I get, I get like a long <laughs> runway to prepare for these. So I pray a lot about what the Lord wants me to speak, but I also typically have to preach it to myself first. And this passage of scripture really, really gripped me at the very end of it where it said, in relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. 
put on the mind of Christ when it comes to each other. I said it two times already, but every another is a, a person Jesus died and bled for. And so we have to do a better job, especially towards those that we say we love the most. We have to do a better job at resolving conflict. We have to set a better example for our kids. We have to help our kids pack a better bag so they can go into their future lives. Knowing how to love, how to resolve with intention, and how to stay together instead of just walking away from every conflict that arises. So the way we're gonna end today is literally, I'm just gonna pray over you guys. I'm gonna pray two prayers. And one, the first prayer is just gonna be, y'all can sit in your seats, you can pull out your notebook if you want. Um, but I'm just gonna pray over you guys. And I want y'all to sit there for a second and just ask the Lord if there's any conflict in your life that is raging right now or maybe simmering under the surface that needs to be dealt with. Just ask the Holy Spirit. So I'm gonna pray that over us. And then we're gonna pray and we're gonna ask the Lord to teach us this week before we go deal with that conflict, okay? So I'm gonna pray over you guys. Lord, we just come right now and we ask, Holy Spirit, that if there is any conflict that needs to be handled in our lives, any place that we need to go approach someone or need to deal with something in our lives, in our marriages, in our parenting, in our workplaces, Lord, that it wouldn't continue to simmer, but Holy Spirit, we just say now to speak. We give you a moment to show us. And I just want you to sit there, whisper that to the Holy Spirit. Show me where I have conflict. And then the last prayer I'm gonna pray over you is, is just for you to ask the Holy Spirit, which bag are you carrying? What's packed in your bag when it comes to conflict? And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, give him permission this week to search you, to know you, and to identify the places in your life where you have not dealt with conflict in God's way. So Holy Spirit, we again also say that you have permission to speak, to search our hearts, to show us what is in our bags. God, I pray that you would show us where we have not been loving to someone with our same last name, where we may have to go own our part, where we may have to go apologize and say from this day forward, we're gonna take all of this other stuff out of our bags and we are only going to, to deal with conflict in the way that the Lord instructs us. Lord, guide us, reveal to us, convict us. You are so good and you are so loving. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.